If you haven't seen episode 51 of Critical Role's Bell's Health Campaign, go watch it right now. Oh, and watch it on the Twitch stream because it is so much fun to see the Twitch stream completely lose their shiznit. Then come back here because there will be spoilers. And I know, I know, I had just said I was only going to do a Critical Role video once a month, so I hadn't planned on doing one this week. But after watching the climax of the Apogee Solstice, I have to chime in and say, oh my gods, this was an amazing episode, but what in the Bell's Hells happened? I've been saying for weeks that it didn't seem like Bell's Hells was high enough level to take on what seemed to me like a very high level campaign. What are they, level eight? That's moderately powerful at the best. So how is Bell's Hells going to take on such high level characters as Odahan Fall, who already wiped them out not that long ago, and Ludinus, who is an Archmage, not to mention all the Sentinel-type Automatons, the Exalted, Imogen's mom, Liliana, who is who knows what level. And if you remember way back when Bell's Hells first met the Vox Machina crew, many of you, at least in my comments, was saying that it didn't make sense that Vox Machina would not be involved in such a world-shaping event. And let's extrapolate that to include the Mighty Nine. Why wouldn't this Rudeus affair attract every high-level group on Exandria? We are talking about a conspiracy to kill the gods. Well, that was all answered because we get some very high-level support. Caleb and Beauregard of the Mighty Nine show up. They are expecting help from the Ashari, specifically Keyleth. And let's not forget, they also have the Nightmare King on their side. Is this enough to stop Ludinus and the Rudeus plot from succeeding? Okay, no, it wasn't. <laughs> if you are watching this, you have already watched the episode, at least I hope you have. So you know that Ludinus succeeded and Rudeus was released. And I don't even know what that means. <laughs> But something happened, and there's a big beam of red light. My guess is that the beam of red light is Pradathos slowly manifesting. But what about that city on Ruius? Maybe they're beaming down little avatars of Pradathos. But then again, there is very little we know about who or what Pradathos is, especially since, apparently, very few writings even exist about Pradathos. So maybe everyone, including Ludinus, have guessed completely wrong, and Pradathus is something totally unexpected. Let me know down in the comments what you think. Okay, the question is, with all the high-level help from the Mighty Nine and Vox Machina, could Bell's Hells have succeeded? I think the answer is yes. I think Matt mapped out a couple of alternate scenarios, even though I think it was probably set up as a bit of a magician's choice. Magician's choice, by the way, means that no matter what the party decides, all roads lead to the same conclusion. But putting that aside, there were several moments where Bell's Hells could have turned the table, but the dice gods were not on their side. For example, one of Bell's Hell's aces in the hole was the Nightmare King, Ira Wendigoth, but Ira was banished by Imogen's mom, even though he had advantage in making the saving throw. Liliana turns and looks, and out of the corner of that chamber, you see Ira begin to shift rapidly through the ruin. Liliana turns and Puts a hand oh, out. No. Ooh, does he have advantage? Okay. Yes, magic resistance. He has advantage on. And she banishes him. 
<laughs> that sucks. He's fine. He's fine. Whoa. He's just gone for a minute. Whoa. Oh, no, he's from another no. realm. Yes. He's, he's gone. gone. He's gone. As long as he's she maintains back concentration. back to the Fey realm. FCG made a terrible roll trying to rescue plane rider Rin, the results of which were, I think the technical term is cattywampus. I mean, I'm just going to go pick her up. <laughs> like, I, yeah, maybe with, with one hand, I'll just uh, grab a piece of that ruined wall and, and sort of just, again, move, move it aside, like I'm trying to cle clear it off or something. Mm -hmm. And then with my other hand, I'll just kind of reach down and grab her so, so it all sort of looks fluid. This, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I, I'm, a, I'm a dumb robot just grabbing rocks. Yeah, she yeah, seems yeah, like yeah, a yeah. rock to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. no, you don't know. Go ahead and make a sleight of hand check. Come on. <laughs> oh, <laughs> From within guide yourself. Guide yourself. the, I the myself if that's possible. Yes, it sleight is. Sleight of hand, I have a plus zero. Great. <laughs> oh my God. Come on, she's oh a rock. God. What's in the rocks? Okay, that's a five. Oh! <laughs> oh, 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 my heart. So you grab, you grab the chunk of wall stone, right? You hit it, and the wall. Oh God! You hit one of the load-bearing sections of the ruin as it now oh. falls. No. 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 Oh, oh, God. God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, that's what he was talking about. <laughs> On to Rin. Oh, <laughs> So but rude. now, the room, like, all the heads go <laughs> and shift right over to where you are, because after two, essentially, terrorist attacks in the chamber, another wall collapsed, and you're standing in the middle of it, clutching a piece of stone. I will, with my body language, because I can't communicate like this, just sort of hold, hold, hold up the rocks and go... <laughs> <laughs> As if to say, oops, sorry. He is the meme. Make a deception check. He is the meme. I guess I'll die. <laughs> Can I guide myself? Sure. Much better. This is deception. Correct. 22. Okay. That's good. Okay. That'll do it. What's, what's the eyebrows? I don't know. Uh... You're so fucking lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you see, uh, like, the the lavender-haired woman uh, in the coat kind of looking down at you uh, glances over towards Ludinus. Ludinus looks back at her and she f takes up and just kind of flies up through the center of the oh, area. To, so it's kind of like dodging through the various catwalks as he kind of looks down and goes, and then does this with his hand. And you, the entire automaton deactivates around you. Oh. Do I deactivate because I'm tethered to it? You do not deactivate, but you currently cannot move this automaton. You are just frozen right in the middle of this space right now with everyone running around you. Oh, God. Okay. The, this also means you lost your visual perspective, too. Oh, God. Oh, my God. You're now within essentially a dead shell with no vision. Earlier, Matt had Marish and Liam, the players, not the characters, make some roles. By this point, we knew that this was to see what their Mighty Nine characters, Beauregard and Caleb, would do to help stop Ludinus. Well, they didn't roll well. <laughs> Which we found out later meant that they were captured and chained up by Ludinus. Fern tried to free Beauregard with the heat metal, and FCG tried to free Caleb with a dispel magic. Both of those attempts failed. Orem had a fantastic plan, as he usually does, to target the backpack that Odohanthal was wearing that contained some sort of device that powers her. We're really not that sure, but he hit it a couple times. It was almost destroyed. But then neither Orem nor anyone else that followed him was able to make that final blow to destroy it. 
that was so close and I was so curious what would happen. Matt, <laughs> yes. this is what I would like to happen. What would you like Let's to see happen? if it happens? Orem comes trucking off of this rubble like a ramp mm -hmm. and with the boots of striding and springing leaps and in the air, uh, grasping vine to that and I want to swing down and land right next to Odahan. By all means. Action surge, because I assume that took action and movement to do that much. Uh, from there, well, it, it, it was running the leap and then the grab on that as a 20 foot pull. Okay. Make an acrobatics check for me. This will let me know whether or not you have to use your action to do so or not. That is a uh, 15. Yeah. 15? <laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> so you run and kind of leap off with the, with the boots. Use that, that vine to pull you an arc around, which gives you kind of the, the arc of movement without having to. to uh, it's a bonus action to use the yes. the vine, so you land there. You still have your action. Okay, so I land by and I pass by a feathered angel on the way by. Yep. Land He's behind Odahan. So attractive. I'm busy. <laughs> I'm busy. I'm right behind Odahan. Mm -hmm. I want to slash the fuck away at the contraption on her back and break it to shit. Okay. So go ahead and make uh, two strikes. Hits eighteen plus nine. Okay, 18 plus nine, yes, that does hit. And I'm just, I'm not even trying to hurt her. Yeah, just I'm just, just trying to wreck that thing. That is 12 points. 12 points of damage. Next one also hits, 16 plus nine. That hits as well. Yeah. Like, literally, <laughs> you you have to have a, a 25 to hit this. So. Okay, that's 10 points of damage. Is it, time? is it still holding in place? It's still holding in place. Action like, sure. you, you see like it's starting to like, spark and Odohan already like is, Looking like over the shoulder and like, action surge. Okay, uh, that is a twenty-two to hit. Twenty-two does not hit, unfortunately. Uh, misses. Shit. It is like barely holding on from what you can see, but you go ahead and strike a second, and Odahan backs up, parries one blade, and then with the other arm, kind of captures your other sword and hold, holds your other attack in place, and goes, "Don't you even dare interrupt." If Imogen could turn her mother against Ludinus, that could have flipped the situation because Liliana, it turns out, was a super powerful major player. All Imogen had to do was do well on a persuasion roll, one of her best abilities, and she rolled. I'm gonna say, <laughs> and mama's head. I'm gonna say. Because I'm, I'm visible now. You are. I'm gonna look up at her. Yeah, she kind of like sees you on the ground now. Make another persuasion check. Oh, man. Loop to Vader, here we go. I'm scared of all my dice. Mama, Janice Joplin. <laughs> oh God. A one. Really? Really? Yeah, that's where we're at. She looks down at you, with, like the sad look in her eyes, and like the tear crawling from her cheek, as the tear kind of like drifts off, kind of joining the rest of the glowing energy and mist around her. And she just says back in your head, "This is for the best." The closest anyone came to completely upsetting the ritual was Chetney. He was able to come up behind Ludinus, who was up on a platform, and if he could have just grappled him or prevented him from moving or just knocked him off the platform, everything would have changed. And he almost made it if it wasn't for some sort of maid shield. To rub salt into the wound of this failure, he fell off the tower, rolling a one and getting impaled. 15 feet up, Come invisible. On, uh, I'm going to hybrid transformation, turn into a werewolf. Okay, so you are no longer invisible. No longer invisible. And I am going to use the claws that are like <laughs> and I'm gonna do, 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 and jump and I'm gonna try and backpack onto the back of Ludinus. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Roll an athletics check to climb the rest of that distance. Okay. You have advantage because you're in your wolven form. Uh, that is uh, a 24. 24 will succeed as you climb up the side here. 
and you're gonna leap towards Ludinus. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have his stuff right. The um, gods do not deserve it. Oh, fuck! I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> you said something about natural predators. Oh! <laughs> All right, so you're trying to grapple him? I am trying to strength grapple his hands to his side if I can. I know it won't do much, but I'm just doing it and getting those fingernails in there if I can. Just Okay, so you okay, got it. Restraining his hands and trying to keep him from doing all this shit. All right. For being in the car wash. So it'd be a, a athletics check versus AC. I usually have advantage in the hybrid form, but do you want to do it a straight roll? No, you have advantage. Okay. Leap down towards him. It's a 19. Oh, nice. 19 is his AC. Uh oh, he's fallen. Shield. Ah. Oh, oh, <laughs> you leap towards his back, and right as you jump towards it, like he's just kind of looking out this way, and he goes, <laughs> and you just watch as this field, you skid across the top and like slide oh, no. over. And as you go over the top, you get one upside down glance of Ludinus just scowling at you. As you begin to fall oh. down. Oh no. Oh no. Uh, I, I will say. On the yeah. <laughs> well, I need you to make a dexterity saving throw. Okay. Okay, that's fair. Go hard or go home. Natural one. Oh, oh no. He's going to get harpooned. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. 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 Hammer horror, oh, real quick. Shit. Oh, yeah. real fun. You take 12 yeah. points of piercing damage and are currently. Restrained as you are now partially impaled on a section of the Malleus Key. This is okay. This is okay. <laughs> I'm not saying that everything that could go wrong did go wrong. I'm not saying that, but <laughs> it was pretty darn close. If just a couple of those dice rolls came out on the other side, we could have had a very different conclusion. But of course, the twist that no one saw coming, at least I didn't see it coming, was Ludinus actually wanting Keyleth to attack him because she was the bait for, wait for it, the champion of the Raven Queen, or is it matron of the Ravens? Whatever she's called now, Vax made an appearance as some sort of avenging dark angel. I was going nuts when he appeared, so were the players, so was everyone in the chat. The earth elemental form cracks, and then what was once shale and pebble becomes red blood scattering on the ground. As Keyleth flies, kind of frozen, eyes wide, Odahan goes for like a, a heart strike, and there's a dark flash in the air. And you see where Odahan's blade was. Instead, you see a cloak of feathers. Oh, oh, Jesus. What? Fuck, what the hell? Black Raven feathers. Wait, oh. where did the bingo? Where did the bingo? Is Vax on there? You see a masked figure with Shut the oh. fuck up, man! Shut up! What? No what? fucking what is way! You cannot be oh serious! God, where is it? I don't know where it is. now standing over and protecting her body. Oh. Oh. Daggers oh in each God. hand. Don't you even dare. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Unfortunately, Vax was the key for Ludinus to succeed because he was turned into some sort of prism of divine energy, which was placed in the Malleus key, which opened up the doorway or did whatever it was supposed to do, so Rudeus is now open. And now, the final piece. The sliver of divinity. The lens. And he snaps as he reaches his other non-withered hand back into the device as the Liana, who's holding her action, goes ahead and casts a spell down towards the Champion of Ravens. You watch as suddenly all the mirrors on the side of the tunnel turn on at once, and these bright beams of energy shunt into him like hundreds of reflecting mirrors. He triggers something within the machine, and you watch as the champion 
Ah! Screams out in pain <laughs> and is compressed down into a sphere of dark shadow. He, he, he. he. Vax is pressed into just a sphere. Liliana lifts it up with her telekinesis and places it into the empty spot of the machine. And now, you see like spark shooting off parts of the machine, the power's not quite there, and he's kind of like. Ugh. Did we hear boom go off behind us yet? Mm-hmm. <laughs> the explosion that I might hits, and you see other parts of the power like powered down, and he's like. It'll have to do. It is time, my children. And right as you look up, you can see there's other sky ships beginning to appear. Oh, what? Different Vasselheim and other forces have begun to arrive just as the red moon glows above. <laughs> you watch as every rood is born in the chamber. Stands. <gasps> Tall, including Imogen, as red energy filters out into the center of the spire. It's being drawn in and glowing, just all of these living batteries all pouring into the center device as it begins to rise and crackle before. Oh, cool! <laughs> hey, the I energy have begins to gather and form. Ludinus glances up. Let us destroy what will unmake them. And you watch as this incredible thick beam of red energy fires up into the sky. It lights up and sends every cloud scattering out of visible sight up into the air, up towards the red moon of Ruidus. You watch as all the sky ships that were just at landing kind of <laughs> begin to crumble with the force blown away from whatever fires up into the darkness. In that moment, Ludinus, kind of still holding his other arm into the machine, smiles, his eyes wide. A thousand years, you couldn't stop me. You couldn't. <laughs> Some of the machines kind of spark a bit. He's like, <sighs> he looks a bit nervously, <sighs> kind of swallows deeply. It's too late. It's too late. <laughs> the red begins to glow brighter and brighter. You watch as all of the tethered Nexus energy, all the converging power of the ley, power of the ley lines begins to spark and grow lighter and lighter. Magical energy begins to flow out in all directions. The sky goes from pitch black to a deep red to a multicolor explosion of magical arcane energy into White, a familiar white. I'm not sure what's going on, and it doesn't appear that anyone else does either, except for maybe Matt, <laughs> because the party was split in two and teleported to two different areas of the world. I thought this climax was amazing. We've been building up towards it for so long, and I personally loved seeing Vox Machina and the Mighty Nine being part of the story, although I know not everyone did. But looking back now, I appreciate that Bell's Hells, so obviously outclassed and outgunned. I mean, look at what happened to their plan to blow up the Malleus Key. Did that even have a chance to influence the final events? I don't think so. But I really do think they could have altered the outcome if some of those die rolls I mentioned before were the 20 or close to it. I think Matt had some alternate scenarios which may have released Rudius, but didn't involve Ludinus. But we'll never know. We'll never know because Ludinus has so thoroughly succeeded. So now we move on to the next chapter in this campaign. What happens now that Rudius or Pradathus or whatever has been released? I personally think there's going to be some type of twist on what Pradathus actually is. I'm really sad that it doesn't feel like we're going to get that spelljammer space adventure, but 
Maybe that's next. Maybe it'll happen. Because there's still that city on Rudius, which we really need to find out more about. Obviously, the first step is for the party to unite. I'm expecting next episode to slow the pace down a bit because we kind of need to catch our breath after all this excitement. But when will we find out what actually happened with the Rudeus experiment? I don't know. The ley lines are still acting up, so what does that mean? It may be some time before everything is clear. But can I just say, I'm continuously impressed with how Matt weaves the storytelling of his campaign. Just thinking of DMing something like this, how much setup and planning and working out contingencies is involved, it is almost inconceivable to me. And he never seems to break a sweat. It could just be he's a trained actor and maybe he's freaking out on the inside, but he always seems so calm and collected. What do you think? How has Matt done developing this storyline? Let me know down in the comments. There's one more thing I'd like to highlight regarding episode 51 in terms of story structure. My thesis has always been that role-playing games as a spectator sport is a new medium of storytelling. But I'm also speculating that Matt is using basic story design to structure his campaigns. We won't be able to fully analyze that until after the end of the campaign, but I think episode 51 could be the midpoint of the campaign. The midpoint of the story is the middle of the second act, which generally is a turning point after which we build up towards a dark night of the soul before we lead to the story's climax. In the save the cat story structure, this translates to the culmination that ends in a false victory or a false defeat. And it certainly seems like a defeat here. So do you think this could mark the midpoint of the campaign's story arc. Again, I'm probably not going to be doing a weekly Critical Role video going forward, but I will try to get one video in a month. So until we meet again, may all the books you read and the campaigns you play be 